people. And they judge the success of their program by tonnage, uh, the number of trophies they've won. And last year, this group eclipsed all other marks in tonnage. I think they took home 14 trailer fulls and 87 tons of trophies from competitions they've been in. And so for your dining pleasure this evening, I'd like to introduce the finest performing group that Benita Vista has ever seen, The Music Machine. Silhouette, 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 oh, 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 o
silhouettes on the shade said to my shot, you're on the wrong bus. Don't over to your house, on my feet, love, you might have never loved. You, my sweet pal, that you and I would be. Two silhouettes on the shade, little more days. Two silhouettes on the shade. Silhouettes, 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 silhouettes. Good night, sweetheart, well, it's time to go. I hate to leave. 
some announcements I need to make before we begin this evening. I've been asked to announce that uh, the balloon arrangements were, were provided for our use, courtesy of Donna Jenkins. So when you leave this evening, you can leave the balloon decorations uh, behind. Also, I'd like to announce that the flower arrangements were, the, were donated to us by courtesy of the Benita Florist, uh, Gary Whitcomb. special guests with us here this evening to celebrate the retirement of Chuck and Shirley from the Vista High School and Sweetwater Union High School District. First, I'd like to int introduce the acting principal of the Vista High School for the next two weeks. Don't <laughs> <laughs> it to be an extended period of time. Is that what you told me to say, Tom? That's it, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Thomas Schaaf. with uh, the former superintendent of the Sweetwater Union High School District and presently a member of the County Board of Education. We all know him and we all love him. Yes. Mr. and Mrs. Joe Randall. Also here to celebrate Chuck's retirement this evening. Chuck, you're a lucky guy. He's going to turn out for you. <laughs> Former mayor, but that's not what's important. <laughs> Former dean of activities. Wow. When I knew this guy, he wore shorts and tennis shoes and funny bow ties to the proms. He's the next best thing that uh, happened to kids since Chuck Shanky. A new school board member bought himself a suit for this evening. <laughs> Mr. Jim Cartmel. Also here this evening to honor Chuck and Shirley on their retirement from the district is the current superintendent of the Sweetwater Community High School District, Dr. John Rinden and his lovely wife, Danny. Former superintendent of the school district, Dr. Bill Bedelford. Said he knew a little bit about Chuck in the past. Okay. Also, would like to acknowledge this evening uh, some people that are behind the scenes and have helped out to put this program together. And if you're here, I'd like to ask them to stand, please. Uh, video man. Frank Schneeman. <laughs> Audio man, Harvey Warren. Actually, the citizen principal of the Mr. High School, and he says that wherever Tom goes, he does not want to follow. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
because Mr. Holmes is not here. So Mr. Holmes is playing the role of Claude Rains this evening in Invisible Man. So I thought, well, that's not going to work. So then I thought, well, the next thing I might try is the old David Letterman stuff. You know, he's got that top ten uh, favorite things that you want to say. So I thought, oh, let me give that a try. I'll do the, I'll do the top ten things that could be said about Chuck Shanky or Chuck Shanky is said. Okay, so, so okay, I'm going to come up with a list. So I started off with my list. Number seven on the list. I couldn't think of ten things to say. <laughs> Number six, Chuck learned this in the U.S. Navy. If it moves, salute it. If it doesn't, paint it blue and gold. <laughs> Number five on the list of uh, top ten things about Chuck Cheney. Beat Nitschke. Number four, go fight win. Number three, paint pep signs. I don't do that kind of work. <laughs> Number two on the list? No, I did not pose as the Baron mascot. <laughs> now tell me that that's true. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> and number one on the list, we heard it tonight when he walked in, holy cow, I love it. <laughs> and so we decided if that was going to be the theme this evening, I love it, Chuck Shanky. So then I started thinking. Chuck's had a long, illustrious career. During that career, he's worn many hats. So I thought, well, we'll go with hats off to you. And we thought we'd talk a little bit about Chuck and all the hats that he's worn during his career. Well, the first hat I came up with was the old athletic hat. Yes, Chuck was an athlete. Chuck, you wear your hat? <laughs> 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 so, now, I've been with Chuck for a few years, and I've been listening to him tell these tales about what a great athlete he was in school, and I thought, no, no, I'm not so sure about that. So then I talked to Shirley, and Shirley confirmed, yes, Chuck was a great athlete in school. And I said, ah, come on, look at this. She said, no, 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 just two years ago, we went back to our little podium hometown in Wisconsin, and Chuck was showing us around. We went down to the old train depot, it's old logging town, and he walks into the train depot, and he say, look, Shirley, look at this, look at that, isn't this great? Oh, I'd love to be back. Oh, this is wonderful, super duper. And this little old lady comes tottering out and says, what are you doing here? He says, what are you doing here? He says, I'm the kid that used to come in every morning and stoke the fire and put the wood and the coal in the stove. And after school, I'd come back in the afternoon and I'd stoke the fire and put the coal in the stove. The lady scratches her head and says, I don't remember. Says, Who are you? What's your name? Chuck. Charles Frederick Shanky. Charles Shanky? You're the basketball star! So I thought, yeah, old Chuck Roots was a basketball star. <laughs> then I got to thinking of that. Well, Chuck is always the kind of guy that's out there, go fight, win, paint a blue and gold, rah, rah, rah. And then I remember, you started telling about the Paul Holupa story. Does anybody here know who Paul Holupa is? Paul Holupa. But he was just a high school basketball star. Holds the county career scoring record. Okay? You talk to Chuck, and he'll tell you it's because of the fine basketball games that he put on as the dean of activities. You know, he got the gym filled, he had them out there in the line until the beginning at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And if it hadn't been for Chuck, Kaluka would never have scored all these points. <laughs> and so here we are, we're down to crunch time. Kaluka's going to break the record tonight. And Chuck's got the banners painted, he's got the band in the gym, and he's whipping around, and he's getting, selling tickets, and he's doing everything he can do. And Halupa comes out, the game started, the fans are going crazy, they're screaming and yelling, Halupa puts it up, boom, scores, got the record. Game stops, Halupa walks over, looks around in the stands, and he's checking things out, and he finally spots his mom and his dad up in the stands. Sitting next to the Halupas, 
Shirley and Chuck. Alupa acknowledges Chuck and Shirley, takes the ball, throws it up to the stands to his dad. Chuck jumps up, <laughs> grabs the ball. Says, he intended that for me. <laughs> and if you go to his house today, they've got a little shrine over the corner that Chuck went and had done. And I researched this through the ASP records. I went down and saw the Blackies invoice. It says, to Chuck, my inspiration. Love Paul in there. He's got that ball sitting right there. So yes, Chuck is an athlete. Now, Chuck, we you and Shirley to come on up here, please. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Taking up on this theme that uh, Chuck wore many hats, just right, right there in the chair. Okay, it's like prom queen. King and queen. <laughs> With this, <laughs> this uh, taking off on this theme of Chuck's more many hats, we got together with the faculty, and they put together, Chuck, a sort of this is your life. And what we'd like to do now is introduce to you and your friends who come here, your friends from Bonita, the Bonita Friends. <laughs>
as the years pass, Chuck's mom realized. <laughs> Regardless, Chuck moved along to high school. Kendall High, class of 49. You know Chuck, gregarious, garrulous, and groovy. But the gang knew that Chuck was a hound on the prowl. You ain't nothing but a Studying, partying, partying, and more. 
world. So, Chuck said this early, Wisconsin is no place to raise a kid. Too much fresh air, outdoor activities, and clean living. So they started dreaming about a place far away. In 1977, 
Hamilton, Chuck planted on his proverbial feet at the best school in the district, but need of us to hide. This is the audience participation section in your little program. You have a copy of the Benita Vista Alma Mater. All right. Please join with us as we sing. <laughs> On the Barrett stand, yes, for Chuck. Benita All Barrett's up. All Barrett's, please stand. Yes. <laughs>
Sorry to ask you to be your friends. Your friends like that. And I don't know. But I do want to dispel one rumor. Jack told me before the uh, festivities this evening that it is not true that he left the district office because he refused to wear white shoes and a white belt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as you've seen, Jack was an 80 man. That brings us to his next hat that he wore in his career. So Chuck, wear your hat here. All right. Yeah, you go ahead and sit there, Chuck. All right. If you've been in a lounge, you know that Chuck is a war hero and a lover boy. And he's had a lover in every port. Well, I did a little investigation. Chuck was in the Navy. His job during the war was to keep the soldiers' teeth clean. He was a dental technician. He was not a war hero. And this rumor about being the lover boy and a lover in every port, not true either. He was doing administrative training at the commissary, bagging for tips. So whatever Chuck tells you about his military career, it's not true. And we've discovered that there's a whole lot of things about Chuck that we didn't know that weren't exactly the way they were portrayed to be. So what we did is we dug up one of his longtime friends to tell you about Chuck up close and personal. Give a big warm welcome to Mr. Tom Harrison, who will lay out the story. I know a lot about Chuck Shanky. Uh, when Paula mentioned that you should wear red, white, and blue tonight, I, I didn't have anything red, white, and blue, so I brought this for you, Chuck. <laughs> Not anything to wear, but I. He said to set, tell some stories about Chuck. Uh, if I mention Tiny Hill, if I mention uh, Paige Cavanaugh, if I mention Neil Diamond, uh, nobody knows anything about how funny those stories are to, to Chuck and Shirley and Betty and I. But uh, one of the first stories I ever heard about Chuck, and by the way, every, you know, a lot of times when you have a ghost, uh, people make up stories. All of these are true, and I, I think after it's over, Chuck will and Shirley will authenticate that. Uh, one of the first stories I ever heard about him was when he was at North Hollywood teaching, and uh, they were having a carnival. And so one of the students at the school that he was at was. Uh, a child of Jane Mansfield. Now, and all of us that are pretty young have read about Jane Mansfield in history books and, and know about how famous she was. Well, they were going to have Jane Mansfield come to a carnival, and uh, it was Chuck's job to go and pick her up at her house. And uh, if you've ever heard anything about James Mansfield, a lot of people who are older than I have told me about her. That, uh, that when you go to her house, everything was done uh, in the shape of a heart, and I'm not going to elaborate, I'm not going to tell any jokes about that, but everything was in pink. And when it was Chuck's job to go and pick up Jane Mansfield for this carnival, and he goes in his little blue, uh, Buick Skylark or whatever he had, and uh, he arrives and Mickey Haggerty, who was the uh, bodybuilder, uh, was there to greet him at the door. And he had carpet about as deep as alfalfa and pink, and he said, Chuck, when you come in, we want you to uh, take off your shoes. Now, my wife warns me when I go to work that you don't dare wear uh, underwear with holes in it because you might have a heart attack and have to go to the hospital and things <laughs> like that. Well, Chuck had a hole in his sock when he went to pick up Jane Mansfield. Now, I don't know how he ever thought she'd fit in that blue Buick Skylark anyhow. But uh, most of us would have said, no, Mickey, uh, we'll just wait out here and uh, let Jane come outside or we'll sit out the curb and honk. But Chuck, he takes off his shoes and with a hole in his sock and, and goes right in. So uh, I think this tells you a little about how determined he is in anything that he does that he sticks with it. 
Now, I've known Chet uh, since 1967. I went to Benita the second year we were in existence out there. We only had uh, 11th graders. Uh, that was the highest. We were 7 through 11. Yet we were playing the varsity schedule. Chuck was the ASB man, and we didn't have any home games. When we played Mar Vista, the only thing that told you we were the home team is we wore the dark jerseys, and Chuck jumped in his blue Buick Skylark and loaded it with, uh, with uh, popcorn and went down to, to Imperial Beach, and uh, he was ready to go. And every Friday he would come by my room and say, you know, I, I think we're going to win today uh, or tonight. Uh, he was always so positive, so optimistic. And, uh, uh, you know, we only had juniors. Uh, I think Castle Park High had uh, cheerleaders that were tougher than our defensive line. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, Wayne and Dick and I sitting back there, we were not so worried, so worried if we were going to lose it was how much, you know. So, but we at least we made a lot of money for the ASB because we were about six or seven homecomings because everybody likes to win their homecomings. <laughs> this optimism, optimism carried on. We had we had season tickets to the Chargers with Chuck and Shirley for about five years, and uh, you know we had, we had a little tailgate party every Sunday. We went out. Uh, Chuck said, you know, I think we're going to win today. I, I know we'll win today. And everybody said, well, you know, Eric Cornell, Dan Fouts, and, and all those people. Uh, this was during Ron Waller and Harlan Savari and uh, Tommy Prothrow years. So uh, the guy has always had enthusiasm. He's always had uh, optimism. Uh, I, I've never seen anybody so enamored with times in their life like birthdays. <laughs> Chuck loves birthdays. Uh, Betty and I had the opportunity to help him celebrate his 40th birthday. Now, Stop right there. Okay. <laughs> this, uh, Chuck, you just, I know most of you here know him and you have to know how he acts and how he reacts to things. So Shirley had called us in advance and said, come up uh, late in the afternoon and we'll go down to Tijuana and have a, uh, a drink or two and we'll have dinner and it's a surprise for Chuck. Now, I know that on his birthday, and I just know about his birthday, that he jumped in that, at whenever Benita gets out, I know they always get out late, but he jumped in that Buick Blue Skylark. And, and, uh, when uh, Old Tire Lakes Road was that two lane road, he burned home because I know that Shirley, on his birthdays, she not only decorates her, the house, but decorates herself. And, uh, so, anyway, they had told us to come up. And uh, if you've been to Chuck Chow's, when you get there, he throws open the door, come in, uh, you know, uh, let me fix you a drink or whatever. Uh, that day, was that the 40th, Chuck? It was about five or six years ago, I think. <laughs> so we were there, and we got there, and rang the doorbell, it was a surprise for him, and the door opened about this far. And when the door opens that far, the Chuck shake his house, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> he didn't say, come on in, what do you want? You know, he had his uh, aqua velvo on and his, uh, and, uh, his robe. And, uh, but anyway, once he finally caught on, it, it turned out to be a pretty good evening. He still was, still was a drink of the Brooklyn Bar in T1. Postscript of that story a couple of months ago on his uh, 60th birthday, uh, we decided to take a little gift up his house. We only live a couple of blocks from him. And uh, we decided to go up there and take him a gift. Uh, this, we got a little smarter this time. We did call. <laughs> there was an answer. Uh, we went up there to quick. 
him only live a couple of blocks away. But anyway, the door only opened that far again, so you're in a little bit of trouble. And I'm sure when we go for his 80th birthday in another 20 years, the door will only open that far. I know a lot of you haven't heard of Kendall, Wisconsin. Uh, I'd never heard of it until 24 years ago. And I, I've met a lot of people from Wisconsin since that time. Uh, my dental hygienist, I asked her if, if she got her hand in my mouth, uh, if she's ever, she's from Milwaukee, and she says she's never heard of Kendall. And uh, another person I know that sells me insurance, he, he's from Wisconsin, he's never heard of it either. But uh, I know that probably many of you in this room have been to Kendall, Wisconsin. <laughs> I know it's between La Crosse and Madison. I looked it up at the Hilltop Junior Library the other day, and by golly, it is there. And, and, but what I'm trying to point out to you is what kind of a person we're dealing with tonight. Uh, there is a town in Oklahoma, I know many of you have heard of, probably been there, called Sepulpa, Oklahoma Indian place. That, I know that probably you've just flocked there, and uh, but uh, uh, I know Betty and I've been there, and I don't know how many of you others have been there, but Chuck and Shirley have been to Sepulpa, Oklahoma. <laughs> I don't know how many people come from Wisconsin to Southern California through Oklahoma and blow 10 cents on the Turner Turnpike from Tulsa to Sepulpa to meet the parents of a friend of theirs. These people do that. The only problem was that my parents were out here two blocks from their house. <laughs> and sure was the, the uh, I don't know. I, I've seen Chuck Shanky speechless. Uh, I don't think probably anybody in this room has ever done it. We all have legends and idols we've met as or uh, we've idolized as children, whether they be actors, you know, Marilyn Monroe, which again we've read about and things like that, and Clark Gable, sports heroes. One of Chuck's growing up in Milwaukee, uh, when the Milwaukee Braves were in, when the Braves were in Milwaukee, they've been so many places, but they were in Milwaukee. Uh, he was a, a big fan of theirs, and uh, it so happened at that time, a former St. Louis Cardinal, uh, Red Shandy's uh, future Hall of Famer, played with the, with the Milwaukee Braves during the late 50s when Chuck was in his boyhood there, and uh, was a big hero as well. Uh, a few years ago, a good friend of mine was with the St. Louis Cardinal organization, and uh, they were playing in San Diego, and uh, we went to the ball game, and afterwards, we went out to have a drink at the hotel where the Cardinals were staying, where Red, and Red Sheenies was the man, manager of the St. Louis Cardinals. And, and Red Sheenies walked in the lounge where we were staying. Now, I don't know how you react. I, I, most of us have never met an idol. But Chuck said, oh my God, there was Red Sheenies. And uh, this friend of mine said, hey, Red, come over here and meet some friends of mine. Well, if you've never seen Chuck Shanky speechless, he certainly was that evening. And only when Shirley did his laundry a couple of, a couple of days later, well, probably she know how excited he might have gotten that evening. But that was just some things that I know. Uh, we all know that, that Chuck went to the district in 1969. I, I was a little bit surprised. Uh, being at Benita Vista and uh, uh, knowing that he decided to go down there. Betty and I, as we still became very good, we were still good friends with him, even though it was the district. We know the district would screw you up, as we see right here at this table right here. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, we, saw, we saw some big changes in Chuck. And uh, we, uh, we noticed those over the a series of the few years, and then in 1967, when he went back to be Benita Vista High, we knew that this is where he belonged, because, you know, he's a teacher, and uh, that's a pretty important word. Uh, 
I will never, of course, be too excited about the Teacher of the Year in the district until Chuck Shank is named that, but he's a teacher. And I'm not going to quote people, but I'm going to quote a great American educator, uh, Nick Nolte, in the movie Teachers. <laughs> he said, the kids aren't here for us, we're here for the kids. Chuck's been there for the kids in the Sweetwater District for 29 years. The parents were missing, we as educators were missing, uh, the ones who are missing the most are the kids. Let me read you a telegram, Chuck, that I got today. Chuck, congratulations on your re retirement. Unlike Casey, you did not strike out. Bob Starr. while I was ill and then I had a while. I picked up a little gift for you and Shirley that really fits for you. Chuck and Shirley, uh, we're down in Bob Hart, and we came from all the way from Phoenix yesterday, flew in, and we have to catch a plane. They are not just friends. They are our family. We've had Christmas, I think Chuck keeps track, 27 years or something like that, and we met through kids in Little League in school, and we love them, and we had four kids go through Bonita Vista High School. We love Bonita. Bob, you say a word. Well, you won't believe this, but I knew Chuck Shanky before he worked for me at the high school. So, uh, Chuck, you're my best friend, and I love you, and uh, we'll see you in Phoenix in a couple weeks. You know, 
though? It's a penny for your thoughts, but you have to put your two cents in. Chuck says, somebody's making a penny on that deal, and I don't want to get in on it. <laughs> well, you know that Chuck's a great teacher, and you know that Chuck makes government live, and you know how he does it. He does it with slideshows and videos and music and the rah-rah. And Bill Demos is here tonight to share with you some of home movies, Chuck Shanky style. Down in my office the other day, 
preparing for his retirement, said he had to get his estate organized. I said, Chuck, you don't have an estate, you're a teacher. <laughs> so he said, well, but you know, I'm kind of concerned about this retirement. You know, I'm so blessed to have Shirley in my life. You know? And I was praying the other night, and I was praying to God, and I said, said to God, God, why did you make Shirley so beautiful? You know what God said, Bill? What, Chuck? He said that he made Shirley so beautiful, so I'd love her. And I said, thanks, God. And I said, God, why did you make her so kind, so considerate, so compassionate, and so understanding? And God said, so you'd love her, Chuck. Well, God, why didn't you give her any common sense? <laughs> so she loved you, Chuck. <laughs> so she was... We want to thank you for giving us Chuck Shanky and, and the family for giving us Chuck Shanky for crawling around on the gym floor, painting posters, and being there until all hours of the night. And surely just by uh, an example of our gratitude, we'd like to present you with this. down at the district talk, we've always got to have her say. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce a tennis coach from Benita Vista High School, Mr. Jim Cartmill. I don't think I'm speaking tonight from a, a district office personnel at all. I think I'm speaking from a student's perspective and uh, the impact that he's made on young people throughout the years that he's been with the district. As a student, I didn't have the privilege of being with him. In fact, Greg Cox was my dean uh, of activities at, in ASB as I was a senior at Bonita Vista High School. And I, I remember I won most school spirit that year for toilet paper in Hilltop with 600 rolls of toilet paper. And uh, that's the kind of impact Greg had on my life. And <laughs> but Chuck, and it's hard for me not to call you Mr. Shanky, but Chuck, you've had an impact on kids uh, that has told them that they could have pride in a school that's not tangible, that they can believe in something, and that they can be proud of that. And you've really left that as a legacy and your impact on kids. As a coach for Benita Vista, as the campus life director there, you really taught me you were a mentor to me, uh, that there isn't any kids around that you can't love enough. And uh, no matter how much they disappoint you, no matter how much they let you down, you keep loving them, and you keep going after them. And you taught me that as a teacher and as a friend. When I ran for school board, you never came up and asked me how the campaign was going. You said, Jim, how are you doing? How's your life going? You were concerned about the individual, about the relationship. And that's what made you an institution at Bonita Vista High School. Because of the impact and the way that you touched my life and the lives of the students you worked with. Survey was taken of a unique group of individuals. You don't quite fit into this category yet because these people were 95 years old and older. And I'm sure when you're 95, you'll still be cracking that door open just a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> not like these people were. There were 50 of them and they were asked to, uh, if they could live their life all over again, what would they do differently? They said three specific things. The first one was that they'd be willing to reflect more on their life. They'd be willing to look back on their life at the things that they accomplished. Just watching tonight on the video and the slides and all that shows uh, the reflections that you can look back on your life and the way in which you live life to its fullest and the way in which you, again, had an impact not only on your family but those that you work with and the kids that you work with. The second thing they said is not only would they be willing to reflect more, but they'd be willing to risk more. You did take those risks. Even when you looked kind of goofy wearing that blue and gold and uh, looked like a crazy man. And the kids were going, who is that teacher that's dressed like that? Why does he do that? And yet you keep reaching out, taking risks, willing to go the extra mile. And lastly, they said not only would they reflect more and risk more, but they'd be willing to be involved in something that outlived themselves. Your teaching career is definitely something that's going to outlive your legacy at Bonita Vista because of the impact you've made on us and your colleagues as teachers. 
My favorite quotation happens to be from the Bible, and it's a verse that says this. It says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than yourself. Mr. Shanky, and I say that out of respect, thanks for being a model of that verse. Your teaching career will live on in my heart, and you'll always be our parent. Thank you very much.
moved up into a dean position, and you were in a dean position out at Benita. And our worlds were still interwoven, but you were at a different site from where I was. And in 1969, you went to the district office. Lo and behold, I did not know that we would be working together again in July of 1976. I think of some of those good memories. I think about the little bit of advice that you gave me at that time. You said, a happy person is not a person in a certain set of circumstances, but rather a person with a certain set of attitudes. And if there's anybody that I know in my life that has a positive attitude, it's a Chuck Yankee, it's a Charles Yankee. And I really appreciate that. Those first couple of years in personnel, I wasn't sure which way was up and which way was down. And you reminded me, uh, may rest in peace, Jim Midgley, you reminded me that Jim Midgley knew 41 ways to tell you what time it was of the day. And he said, learn your lessons well because it'll pay off. And we used to talk about that many, many times. I can also remember one of many weight contests. It looks to me, Chuck, today we both lost. <laughs> <laughs> but we would have these weight contests, ladies and gentlemen, and we would just lose 10% of our body weight. And we would work at this, and it was a big contest in the district office. Everybody knew about it. But about the last 72 hours, Chuck stopped eating, and I stopped eating. I thought we were both wrestlers walking around spinning <laughs> all the time. We had a few weight contests, and I think I was successful in most of those, Chuck, but today I'm not so sure as I look down just a little bit. Then about five years ago, I remember, true story, you called me and you told me about a Russian fable. We were with, Bill had moved out of the district, and I was in the personnel. Well, maybe I'm exaggerating just a little bit on this, Chuck. You're trying to remember what you told me. You told me about this Russian. And he was walking in the snow in Siberia. And he heard this little chirping sound, a little chirping sound. And he kind of looked down to the side. He saw this half-frozen bird. And he told me about this story. And he said this Russian took this half-frozen bird and put him in his coat and warmed him up. And as he started, started to thaw out, the bird started to chirp a little bit more and chirp a little bit more. And finally, the Russian knew that he couldn't keep that bird inside the coat all, all along, looked to the side of the road, and here was some, yeah, you call it, molded it around, put the bird in there, and the bird was nice and warm in that stuff. <laughs> and pretty soon, a Russian bear came along. And lo and behold, the Russian bear ate the bird. And I said, Chuck, what's that mean? What's the moral of that story? And he said, the person who put you in there is not necessarily your friend, your enemy. And the person who took you out is not necessarily your friend. But when you're in it up to your neck, don't chirp. <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped chirping about five years ago, Chuck. <laughs> I appreciate the advice. Then in January, you called me once again. And in January, you said, John, you've made it. You've got a big set of responsibilities. Remember the two rules of management. I said, Chuck, I'm not sure what the two rules of management are. He says, remember, you can't make a mistake if you follow the two rules of management. So Chuck, I want you to know for the five, last five months I've been following these rules. First of all, delegate to subordinates. And also defer to higher powers. <laughs> Better think about that one. <laughs> Better think about it. Chuck. I wanted to end on a very serious note, and I have a written statement here which kind of describes our relationship for 27 years, yours, Shirley's, Jenny's, and mine. But it's really describing you. We've had a lot of fooling around tonight, a lot of laughter, but I want to end on a very, very serious note because of how much I feel and think about you as a friend and almost as a brother in many respects. Charles Shanky is a man bent on shaping his mind to give happiness to others. Charles Shanky's life leads upward. He cherishes worth. He's fair. He's broad. He's calm. He's spacious. His own life is modest. He puts deeds before words. He helps the needs of others. He considers what is right not what will pay. He trusts in justice, not in favor. He is consistent 
not changeless. He is firm, not quarrelsome. He is my friend. He is our friend. Chuck, I love you like a brother. Congratulations on your retirement. Best wishes. Yeah.
putting me on last, there's absolutely nothing left to say. But I know from personal experience that when a person leaves a site, that for whatever reason there's a small fear that, you know, it's just a bad time, they'll be forgotten, that friendships and memories will eventually fade. That was the first thought I had when Chuck told me he was going to retire. Not that Benita would forget Chuck, not Mr. Barron, the very heart and soul of Benita High. Chuck will be remembered every time we look at the school's mascot, or the logo on the gym floor, or the white wind banners at the football games. The thought was that Chuck would forget us. So we had to think of something that would ensure this did not happen. So we got together, put pen to cloth, and created a lasting expression of our friendship and good wishes. Dr. Alfred here this evening, you know, another great superintendent. 
in our school district. And of course, we had John, you know, shake the scholar's hand coming in and shake John's hand going out. I, I, it's got to be a good, good Guinness Book of Records or something. I, I think so. Well, you know, again, I want to thank all of you for this beautiful, beautiful meeting, evening, and I know Shirley thanks you too, my, my son and daughter, and my son-in-law as well, Jeff. And things like this just don't happen. Somebody, and I'm going to find out who, has been working on this thing for months. I mean, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for John Eisenhower, and you know, Storm and Norman and all these guys, they, these guys are great military leaders, but boy, young people, and talk about keeping secrets, I mean, it's not fair. So it's, it's fair for something like this to be put off in such a complete uh, surprise like it was tonight. Well, in conclusion again, I don't know what else to say, but and, well, one other thing, this, this group up here on the stage, now, we have a senior banquet at the Sheridan Hotel next Tuesday night. This is the fourth year we put on the entertainment. For some reason, we haven't been rehearsing for the last two weeks too much. I don't know why. <laughs> They've been rehearsing by themselves, and they didn't count me in on this thing. And we're out there, and I got a bone to pick with you people. <laughs> really. Well, all of the people that came up here, and Jim Cartwell, thank you so much for the fantastic remarks. I appreciate it. And Wild Bill McLaughlin, and I'll be down to check out that estate paper with this real soon, big guy. And Tom Harrison, uh, for those of you that aren't aware of that telegram that Tom had here tonight, uh, which I, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to get it framed. It comes from a gentleman I met a number of years ago I have a great deal of respect for. He's currently the announcer for the Boston Red Sox baseball team, a fellow named Bob Starr. And uh, he's about a humble guy as you'd ever want to meet. Well, just like that other kid over here from Sepulpa, Tom. And thanks a lot, Tom. Really appreciate that. Well, I believe we've got to go to work tomorrow. And uh, I want to thank all of you again for coming by. And uh, Bill, you going to say anything here at all? Is that it now? No. OK. Well, anyway, we love you all dearly. And God bless everyone here. Thank you so very, very much.